Okay, this is 11.3 length contraction and relativistic motion. Now this is sort of the next piece from the last lesson, where the last lesson we looked at time dilation, now we look at length contraction. And the two go really hand in hand. So here at length contraction, just like we had a proper time, we also have proper length. This is LS is the length measured by a stationary observer. And here we're talking about stationary relative to the object or to the length they are measuring. And our relativistic length then, well, let's talk about this here um, in our picture below. You can see we have observer 1 with his clock standing on his platform, observer 2 is standing to the side, and there's a distance here, A to B. And so observer 2 is watching as observer 1 goes between those two points. So here we have observer 2, measures the time delta Tm, for observer 1, to travel from point A to B, which is a distance of Ls in observer 2's perspective. At the speed v. So then that um, means that for observer 1 to go from a to b at speed v, well, that makes sense that ls is going to equal v delta tm. So the, the distance from observers to observer 2's perspective is going to be the speed observer 1 is moving times the time it seems to take for observer 1 to, to travel. So ls is v delta tm. For observer 1, observer 1 measures lm, which is equal to, again, his speed, times the time he seems to be going, from his perspective, v delta ts. So they're both measuring some distance based on their own, uh, based on the platform speed and the time that they perceive. And if we plug those two into the equation for our delta t from yesterday, we get a new equation for lm. lm equals ls times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Just like that. Okay, so it looks fairly similar to our equation for delta Tm. Alright, so again we have a picture down here of what's going on. So you can see this first picture is really the situation we were talking about. The second picture shows an analogous situation, now from Observer 1's perspective. So Observer 1 is on the platform and it appears like Observer 2 is moving past him at some speed v. And points A and B are measured there. So you can see that, again, it's, it's just relative. This last picture shows the ratio of LM over LS. So as speed gets closer to C, you see that the size shrinks more and more and more. So when, um, when we're moving very close to zero or not much, then the ratio here is the same, of course. But as the speed increases, length contracts more and more and more. All right, so let's try a problem with this. It says an observer on Earth measures the length of a spacecraft traveling at a speed of 0.7 c to be 78.0 meters long. Determine the proper length of the spacecraft. Well, we want the proper length because the observer on Earth sees the spacecraft traveling. It looks like it's uh, 78 meters long from that perspective, but 
the only person who can truly measure how long the spacecraft is is somebody on the spacecraft, somebody that's not moving relative to the spacecraft. So we're told that LM is equal to 78.0 meters, and we're told that V is equal to 0 0.700 C. We have our equation here, LM is equal to LS square root 1 minus V squared over C squared. And now we want to solve for LS. LS is equal to root 1 minus V squared over C squared divided by LM. Um, have I got that right? Oops, I did that backwards, I'm sorry. LS equals LM divided by square root 1 minus V squared over C squared. Good, that looks better. Okay, we can plug in some numbers now. We have 78.0 divided by square root 1 minus 0 0.700 C squared over C squared. Again, our C squareds are going to cancel out. So we get 78.0 divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.7 squared. So we get um, 0 0.49. And we get a result of 109 meters. There we go. So that's how that sort of a problem looks. We'll take a look on the next page here. And we have a second idea, relativistic momentum. Relativistic momentum is, the idea is that momentum behaves differently from what we've seen, behaves differently at fast speeds. And that shouldn't be too surprising. It seems like everything behaves a bit differently at fast speeds. So we have an equation for this. Our equation looks like P equals mv. Again, that's looking familiar to start with. But we need to divide it by our correction term again. 1 minus v squared over c squared. Again, that pops up a lot, that correction term. And there we go. We've got a picture of what momentum looks like at different speeds. And you can see that um, the Newtonian momentum would just linearly increase even past C. It doesn't seem to have any bounds, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So you can see that really momentum goes pretty straight until it ramps up very, very quickly as it approaches C. Good. And notice that in P, we actually have V on the top and V on the bottom. So that's going to cause a bit of a different result than the other measures we've looked at so far. So the problem says, in experiments to study the properties of subatomic particles, physicists routinely accelerate electrons to speeds close to the speed of light. An electron has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms and moves with a speed of 0.99 c. Calculate the electron's momentum using the non-relativistic equation. Well, that's easy enough. Got P. Um, I'm going to call this P classical. Your textbook calls it P classical. I like that. So it's using classical, moment, uh, classical mechanics. is equal to mv. And we've got our mass here. We've got 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. And we're, we've got 0 0.99 times c, 3.0 times 10 to the 8. Here we go. Gives us 2.7 times 10 to the negative 22 kilograms meter per seconds. Excellent. So there's our original momentum. And now we want to calculate the electron's relativistic momentum and compare these two results. So let's see here. 
we have P, relativistic, is equal to mv over square root 1 minus v squared over c squared. And we can again fill in some numbers here. So we've got our mass 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 times our v which was 0 0.99. No, it's the exact same as what we had above here. It's the momentum we had above. But now we divide it by our correction term over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. I'm not going to write out that whole thing right now. It's obviously going to come out to just 0 0.99 squared. As we've seen, the c squareds cancel each other out. This gives us a value of 1.9 times 10 to the negative 21 kilogram meters per second. Kilogram meters per second. And if we want to compare these two, well, notice that the relativistic momentum is much, uh, not much smaller, it's a bit smaller than the classical momentum. And, um, or sorry, not smaller, it's larger. So we find that the relativistic is greater than the classical, which matches that picture that we have up here where it really ramps up. It should always be larger or the same size as the classical momentum. Um, and if you do the math, it's by about seven times. There we go. That's that uh, problem. There's a few homework problems. Give them a try.